Take God's Word and find 2 John, and I'm going to endeavor to finish this message in our new series entitled, Buckle Up, Securing Truth in Satanic Times. And we preached last week the beginning of a message I entitled, Don't Share, based on 2 John, verse 11, that says, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Speaking, of course, of someone who preaches a false gospel, who denies the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as the scripture presents him and does not walk in the doctrine of Christ and his apostles. And we looked at this first half of 2 John through verse 6, basically, and I endeavored to show you the application that Christians are bound together in unity, not some synthetic unity, but the unity of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it, it's a personal thing, verse 2, because of the truth which abides in us. We have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, amen? And not only that, it's a permanent thing, verse 2, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. And that's awesome too. And it's public. Verses 3 and 4, John writes, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. This is a public thing. There is a visible, listen, it's not an invisible thing that we all just wink and say, well, I'm, I'm really a Christian. No, people can see us. We meet on Sunday morning at the very least, I hope, and we are visible in the world. We take a stand for the truth. We are publicly identified with Jesus from the time that we profess him through believer's baptism and then as we walk together in unity. And as we walk together in the truth of Jesus, we also rejoice, and this was number one, we rejoice in the truth that binds us. In other words, what brings us together, it's the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just, well, let's love one another. Well, we, he's going to talk about loving one another, but he's going to tell us exactly what that looks like. What does it mean to love one another? Is it just to sing kumbaya or say we're all together or let's not judge or let's be nice? No, love is walking in the truth. And we rejoice in the truth that binds us also by our lifestyle of following Jesus, which is not to be confused with social activism. That's why in verse 5 he said, And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love that we walk according to his commandment, and this is the commandment that as you have heard it from the beginning, you should walk in it. Let me show you something before we jump back in. And I've, I've, You did good listening to the review, so keep on listening. But let me just show you something. If you look in verse 1, he, he starts with the subject of truth. You have known the truth. I love you in the truth, and you have known the truth. Do you get the idea that the basis for all that he's about to say is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you do, then you're following along great. And then verse 3, he talks about in truth and love. And then in verse 4, he mentions the truth again. You're walking in the truth. And all of those can be tied, I believe, are referred to by the phrase in verse 5. Look at it. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. So, he said from the beginning, love one another, but that's tied to the truth. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. It and commandment, I believe, refers to the truth. Now you'll notice commandments is plural in verse 6. 
And then that uses the singular after that. And I think the commandment is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, we're being told some things today, and not just from the left-wing media, but from pulpits. And not just from liberal pulpits, but from so-called evangelical pulpits. We're being told that all are racists if you're a white person, and you just need to admit you're a racist. We all have white fragility. Now, if you're not white here today, hang on. I think you're going to appreciate what I'm going to say. And I think the, for those who know me, you know that I am absolutely vehemently opposed not only to hate and racism, but to anyone who calls his or herself a Christian and holds hate in their heart towards someone based on their race or any other factor for that matter. But white fragility is that it's what I have right now. See, I, I'm defending myself. See, see, I'm, I'm a racist, but I don't know it. That's white fragility. The topic on the news and in classrooms everywhere, as well as our own Southern Baptist Convention, is now CRT, or critical race theory and intersectionality. What is that? Let's define it more specifically today. Critical is a word that means to analyze or conflict with, and it's rooted in the original conflict theory of Karl Marx. Now, I hope that, remember, the series is titled Buckle Up. You're going to have to buckle up. You're also going to have to put your thinking cap on today, okay? But I'm going to try to keep this basic. Karl Marx, the father of communism, said, or socialism and communism, said all social classes are competing for a limited pool of resources. See, that's the opposite of capitalism. Capitalism says wealth can be created by entrepreneurship, hard work, ingenuity, other things. And communism says, no, we've just got to take what's there. There can be nothing new, and we redistribute it. And when you do take that view, there is no new wealth. That is true when you, when you operate in that way. But this produced, this critical theory or conflict theory, produced what others called hegemony, where one dominant group imposes their ideas on the rest of society and tries to control them. And based on these ideas, critical theory was born in Frankfurt, Germany. Marxism failed to overtake capitalism earlier, so it was retooled by some scholars, mainly in the 1960s. I've typed this out in my own words because I, 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 I've got to manage our time well today, okay? <laughs> they were trying to say, we don't like fascism, which is like a despot, like a dictator who controls everything and says who can get what. We don't like communism, it, traditional communism. It, it's failed to uh, be a... Um, a uh, something that will work in a country or society and it does not really address the social inequitable experiences of others so even though it has a godless worldview we like that part so from these thoughts uh, they develop this critical theory and then from this there were some people who did believe in God they were Catholic priests and they were in Latin America and they developed liberation theology. And this blossomed in the 1970s with the idea that the poor could interpret the Bible correctly and no one else could. They had a special experience which informed their knowledge. By the way, it's interesting that 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John are all written, scholars believe, in response to an early form of Gnosticism, which is that certain people alone have secret knowledge and they have the corner on the market of God and they have something that the Bible doesn't have that's been revealed to them and by the way you need to listen to them because you need to get their secret knowledge it's it's interesting that that's where John is is writing and that this is a form essentially of that James Cone later uh, as we quoted last week wed this liberation theology to the black experience in this country and uh, I want to quote him again just briefly uh, where he says that the answer to uh, hermeneutics, that is being able to interpret the Bible correctly, is in fact uh, black theology and black liberation theology where he says this, and I quote, 
wherein the poor recognize that their fight against poverty and injustice is not only consistent with the gospel, but is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He uh, affirmed another author that said, the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus died in our place on the cross to atone for our sin, but rather, and it, was, it went something like this, if you'll remember, Jesus was showing how to address oppression and giving us a vision of how to do ministry to those who are poor. Now, to be sure, Christians have an obligation to the poor. To be sure, there's a lot of scripture about the poor, and not only that, there's a lot of scripture about how the gospel was preached specifically and intentionally to the poor. But Cone championed these theologians that absolutely deny, listen, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ for our sins. And I want to just share with you a technical definition of CRT because I think it will be helpful uh, for you. And uh, here, here it is. This theory, uh, let me make sure I, I get this exactly right because I don't, here it is, CRT, this is according to UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. Critical race theory recognizes that racism is ingrained in the fabric and system of American society. The individual racist need not exist to note that institutional racism is pervasive in the dominant culture. This is the analytical lens that CRT uses in examining existing power structures. CRT identifies that these power structures are based on white privilege and white supremacy, which perpetuates the marginalization of people of color. CRT also rejects the traditions of liberalism and meritocracy. And what that means is liberalism is a very general word there, which means it references the liberal activists that wanted there to be equality and that were for civil rights. All of the basis for wanting civil rights in this country, that for which Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, stood for and ultimately died for, that is actually rejected by CRT, though they would not admit it. And they're rejecting, hey, you, you get somewhere in life by earning it. Legal discourse, I go on, says that the law is neutral and colorblind. However, CRT challenges this legal, quote, truth by examining liberalism and meritocracy as a vehicle for self-interest, power, and privilege. He's saying any earlier attempts to help make people equal really were based on other people wanting power and what's ironic is that's exactly what critical race theory is it's just other people wanting political power and wanting to undermine the christian worldview now with point number one as our rock solid theological foundation which if you'll remember is simply that we are to be unified Binded to, bound together by the truth. We said rejoice in the truth that binds us. And you might say, why did you say rejoice? I'll get to that at the very end of the message. But rejoice in the truth that binds us. And we know that that's the gospel message. And we know that that is uh, also something that's permanent, public, and personal. And we're bound together by how we live out that in Christian community that belief in the gospel and that love for our brothers and sisters. So with that as our foundation and at least a little bit of understanding about what we're hearing in the news, what it actually is, critical race theory and intersectionality, which I'll, I'll mention intersectionality later, other than instinctively, listen, other than you instinctively by the spirit of God in you just knowing it's bad and, and, and that it is inherently racist and a promoter of racist ideas and reverse discrimination let us ask how we should carry on as a gospel people because what we are not saying is that there's no racism in america what we are not saying is that we don't need to work for justice what we are not saying is that we don't need to speak up for the disenfranchised we're not saying any of those things so why are we making such a fuss about this other thing called critical race theory we wouldn't say there's no racism in America, and that's what they're saying. But they're saying some other things in addition to that. You see, built upon the truth that binds us together, 
we're also to carry on our lives in a certain way, and it's not the way that these certain Christians who are now bedfellows with people who reject the traditional view of the atonement of Jesus Christ, it's not the way they say to do it. So here we go. Number two, revitalize the love that brands us. Christians are identified by the love that they have for one another. Verse 5, And now I plead with you, lady, as not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. Surely everyone can agree that we ought to love one another. The I is emphatic there. Paul is saying, I, I'm personally, directly, not Paul, John, excuse me, I'm pleading with you. Paul's a good guy too, but this is John. They should have, have ears to hear. This is a commitment from his heart, and he's soliciting a commitment from their heart. If he didn't love them, he wouldn't be so urgent and direct. I mean, this is a very urgent and direct, albeit small, letter. He's saying there's deceivers out there. You're going to be faced with this. Verses 7 through 11, you can read it. And there's this idea that, that error creeps in, and, it, and the idea is that it, it not only has a potential, listen, to creep in, but that it already has crept in. How do we know that? Number one, just some of the original language and how it's done. And you, you'd have to look at some tools maybe to know that. But number two, uh, he says, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth. He, he's saying every, some people have already been infected by a false gospel. But Christians, what are we to do? We, we are to revitalize our love for one another. It brands us. It, it marks us out for the world to see. Let me just give you a few more quotes. I'm going to give you quite a few quotes today, and it's good stuff. You just need to buckle up and put your thinking cap on, all right? But I, I just want you to listen to uh, Dr. Vody Bauckham. Dr. Vody Bauckham is a man of color. Uh, he is a dean at a school in Zambia. But he's an American. He grew up in California, and he got all his degrees here uh, all the way through Ph.D. at uh, Southwestern Seminary, I believe. And I just want you to listen to some of the things that he says about what we need to do in response to CRT. He says, and I quote, Racism is real. Injustice is real. No matter how many times I say those things, I still will be accused of turning a blind eye to them. Not because I deny them, but because I deny the CRT view that they are normal and at the basis of everything. And then he says we must confront the lie and hold to the truth. Black Lives Matter is a Trojan horse. A Trojan horse, remember the Trojans sent the big gift in to the Greeks and... They had soldiers hidden, and then they defeated them. Remember that? The movement that has a name that Christians find attractive because we love God and we love our neighbor, and we have a desire to see justice done. And for some, that has come to mean embracing the false narrative of, quote, state-sponsored terror against black and brown bodies, end quote. We must love our God, his gospel, and our brothers enough to challenge this false narrative. However, in doing so, we need to go deeper. And here's what he says. There is no reason people gravitate toward the false narrative of, quote, state-sponsored terror. For some, it is in their own negative personal experience. For others, it is the constant barrage of the media's repetitions of the false narrative. For a few, the attraction lies in the inordinate power they suddenly have as the world seeks to, quote, listen and to center their voice. For many white Christians, now this is a black man speaking, okay? For many white Christians, it is the opportunity to assuage their guilt. In all of these instances, we must listen to our sisters and brothers and show compassion. However, we must also remember our first commitment and tell them the truth. We must take these thoughts captive. The facts about Black Lives Matter are not in dispute. The organization is a Marxist, revolutionary, feminist, misogynist, pro-LGBTQIA+, pro-abortion, and anti-family with roots in the occult organization. It is unacceptable 
for Christians to partner with, celebrate, identify with, or promote this organization. And that includes being bullied or pressured into using the phrase, Black Lives Matter. And he, he goes on to say a few other things. I want to just give you one of them. He said, this book was hard to write. He's talking about this book, Fault Lines is what it's called. The Social Justice Movement and, ev and Evangelicalism's Looming Catastrophe. I recommend you read every word of it. He said, I knew that no matter how careful I was, how irenic, deferential, or gracious, the very content of this book would be deemed offensive, unkind, and insensitive. Some will go so far as calling it violence. So why write it? I write it because I love God more than life, the truth more than others' opinion of me, and the bride of Christ more than my platform or any other platform. I want to unmask the ideology. Catch this. I want to unmask the ideology of critical theory, critical race theory, and intersectionality in hopes that those who have imbibed it can have the blinders removed from their eyes and those who have bowed in the face of it can stand up, take courage, and contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Then he goes on to say this, pastors, I beg you to consider what I've written here. I believe the church, your church, is under attack. As shepherds, we must defend the sheep. We must repel the wolves. And yes, the wolves are many. However, this one is within the gates and has the worst of intentions. He desires to use your genuine love for the brethren as leverage. Don't let him. I wish I could go on. He gives several scriptures about not regarding anyone according to the flesh, 2 Corinthians and, and Galatians, about we're one in Christ. What, what's he saying? He's really saying the same thing that John is saying. That there are some intruders with an intrusive message, an illegitimate message, an illegitimate gospel, and they're trying to derail us. There are many deceivers that have gone out into the world, John said. He, he's not even just saying there's just those in your community, lady. He's saying this is a common thing. There are many deceivers. But you need to love people by telling them the truth. That's what revitalizing the love that brands us means. Christians are identified by the love they have for one another. But here's the next thing. Christians prove, this is also revitalizing the love. Christians prove their love for God and others by living a life governed by the gospel. Governed by the gospel. In other words, what is loving is to tell people the truth. What is loving is is to not compromise the truth. What is loving is to not accommodate error. That's what he's saying. He's saying, look to yourselves. We don't want to lose what we've worked for. He's not talking about salvation. He's saying God has gospel rewards for us for preaching and teaching and loving and living the gospel, and we're in danger of getting off track. God has so much for you. Don't get off track with all of this stuff in the media. Well, we might be misunderstood if we, if we say something against critical race theory. Then they'll think we're racists. That's a risk you're going to have to take. Let me just go ahead and say it. They already think you're a racist. Even if you're a, a black person, if you speak against it, you have betrayed your race. And in a weird, twisted way, I can find you quotes, you are a racist. Speaking the truth is loving. But pastor, what about Micah 6, 8? He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Well, the context there, and it's always taken out of context today, the context is they're asking God, what are we to do? And they're trying to undo the wrongs they've committed in the past. And they even mention sacrificing their sons. And God responds through the prophet, just love, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. In other words, don't do penance, but be my people. They were a theocracy, remember? God was the head of the nation of Israel, or he was supposed to be. They didn't always acknowledge him. But as my people... Don't do penance or try to make up for the past. Love mercy, graciousness, and live with a low view of self and a high view of God. But CRT, in intersectionality, embraces the penance, ritual, and sacrifice of the previous verses. Virtue signaling, equity of outcomes, and repenting of whiteness instead of the equivalent of verse 8 
which would be, yes, don't mistreat people, and love mercy. What does it mean to love mercy? Well, if you love the mercy of God, you'll extend mercy. In other words, oh, I'm such a recipient of mercy, so how can I not have mercy and seek mercy for other people? Salvation of the human soul is the answer. Doesn't mean you don't vote. Doesn't mean you don't try to legislate equitable laws. But salvation in the heart is the answer, not neo-Marxism, not the redistribution of wealth or of experiences or tearing down a system. Our, yes, there was racism. Yes, there was. Did you know some? Did you know slavery existed before the United States of America? I mean, I mean, it's, this is absolute. Listen, Jesus and Paul. Do, do you not think they, they were living in a time of slavery? You say, well, it wasn't colonial slavery. No, but there was terrible types of slavery and persecution. You know the greatest persecuted people of all time are not black people? Now, it includes some black people because there are black Jews and there are black Christians. But those two groups I just mentioned are the most persecuted, disenfranchised people of all time. Now, to be sure, they've done their share of disenfranchising people as well. But we don't need to tear down. It's not that everything in our country that it's afforded everybody the opportunities they have today, that is not built upon racism. And since we're dealing with quotes, do you remember the quote at the beginning of the sermon last week that said, we do not believe that there could ever exist a state with a lasting inner health if it is not built on eternal social justice and so we have joined forces with this knowledge. I bet none of you guessed who said it, but I'll tell you, maybe you did. Adolf Hitler said that. But you cannot live your life governed by the gospel and critical race theory at the same time. You say, well, what about this intersectionality? What is that? Well, it was developed by a student of James Cone. Remember, James Cone wrote The Lynching Tree and these things about how Jesus didn't die for our sins. He was just showing what to do to the oppressed, for the oppressed. But Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, his protege, said that all layers of your life intersect with other sources of oppression. And let me just give you an example of how this plays out. I think it is very, very telling. Val Rust, that's a name, He's an award-winning education professor at UCLA. He was a pioneer in the field of comparative education and spent his time mentoring students from around the world. His students praised him for his compassion and integrity. But in a graduate level class on dissertation preparation, he became the target of student protests. We're having a lot of those these days. Some of you were in the 60s with a lot of those too. He was criticized for the political implications of what he deemed to be proper punctuation, insisting that the students follow the Chicago Manual of Style for formatting their papers. This eventually resulted in radical students entering his classroom and, among other things, accusing him of racial microaggressions that have been, quote, directed at our epistemologies, that is, the, our framework of beliefs, our intellectual rigor, and to a misconstruction of the methodological genealogies that we have shared with the class. In all of this, neither the administration of the school nor his colleagues defended Rust. Even when the dean announced that Rust would not be allowed to teach for a year, this was not enough for the radicals. The school pressured him to resign, and the administration pandered to the students. Nothing was said about the unwarranted displays of narcissistic victimhood, but a committee was formed to discuss the matter. Its final report stated, Recently, a group of our students have courageously challenged us to reflect on how to enact our mission in our own community. We owe these students a debt of thanks. The lesson is clear. You can be called a bigot and lose your job for correcting a student's grammar and spelling. And that's from Erwin Lutzer's book, We Will Not Be Silenced. By the way, another wonderful book. You say, this is absolutely crazy. You're exactly right. It is. But it's more than crazy, church. It's evil. And we've got it even creeping into Christian organizations. What is God's way? We don't try to prove we're anti-racist. We prove we love God and others by living a life governed by the gospel. We share it. We forgive. We treat people as we want to be treated. We're gracious. 
We don't judge. Our heart's been changed. There's not a structure that needs repairing. There is a soul that needs rebirth. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the difference. Revitalizing the love that brands us will invariably lead to speaking the truth of Jesus in love. And that's what John does as he warns them. Now, here's the last point. Not only do we revitalize the love that brands us and do we revitalize the, uh, the truth that binds us, but we recognize the threat that tries to beguile us. Listen to verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Oh, John, you're just so, oh, I mean, I, people couldn't handle him today, could they? W what is this threat? Well, the devil is at work to deceive unbelievers and derail believers. Verse 8, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. This is the question for you. Who are you going to listen to? You're going to listen to the mob, the media mob? You, you can't listen. You can't afford to listen to them. This, this is what they are feeding our young people. This is what, what dominates the education system now. And specifically, this is what they're feeding the black community. The results of a deceptive worldview, of always being a victim, victim, victims, and more victims. Let me just give you a couple of, of examples of this, all right? Back in Bodie Bauckham's book, bear with me. He was saying, you know, all these black people are being killed. Sure, there are black people who are killed. There are white people who are killed. And by the way, if they prove that a police officer, I don't care what color, I don't care if he's purple, white, green, what color he is, if he abused his authority, if it's a bad shoot, if he commits police brutality against someone for any reason, he ought to be thrown in jail, prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Amen? Amen. But these people are saying that, that it's up to us to tell our sons uh, that, that fortunately there are some voices that saying it's up to us to tell our sons that those songs on the radio may glorify violence, but in my house we will give glory to achievement, self-respect, and hard work. You know who said that? An unlikely source. President Obama said that. It's a very good quote, a very good thing to say. But according to the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, in 2000, for people aged 10 to 34 years, homicide rates were more than 11 times higher for blacks than the rate for whites. And that number has not improved. In 15, homicide rate for blacks aged 10 to 34 years was 13 times the rate for whites. And almost all of those murders happen not at the hands of the police or white people, but other blacks, usually young black men. This, these are just bare facts. He went on to say this. He said, white perpetrators account for 15% of the cases, while black perpetrators account for 85%. This is a black man writing this and presenting this research. In other words, far from there being an epidemic of whites hunting down innocent, unarmed black men, these are not my words, remember, when it comes to interracial violence, black people are overwhelmingly more likely to victimize white people than the other way around. A police officer is 18.5 times more likely to be killed by a black assailant, no matter what color he is, than an unarmed black man is to be killed by a police officer. And then I want to just give you one more example of this that I think everyone, you know, statistics, you can make statistics say anything, although I believe with all my heart that Dr. Bauckham has been honest with these statistics and used them in, in the right way. But I just want to give you one example, kind of as Law and Order used to say, the TV show ripped from the headlines. Remember that? For those of you who follow that show, this is about the Breonna Taylor case. Do you remember that? This woman, she's a black woman, the police had a no-knock warrant and they shot her in the bed and all of this. Well, see, I've already lied to you just now. But Cameron, who was the black DA, he presented six myths at his press conference. Myth one, the police were at the wrong house. Myth two, the officers used a no-knock warrant. 
They were specifically told to knock and announce their presence and claim that they did. Myth three, the officers did not announce themselves. Eyewitnesses testified that the officers both knocked and announced. Myth four, the officers started the firefight. Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, admitted he fired the first shot. Myth number five, one of the officers was shot by friendly fire. The officers all fired 40 caliber rounds. The injured one was hit by a 9 millimeter round, which is what Walker used, the boyfriend. Myth six, the officers shot Brianna Taylor in her bed as she slept. Taylor was shot in the hall as she stood next to Walker, who opened fire. After the DA, Cameron, a black man, delivered his remarks, several reporters asked telling questions. One inquired about the racial makeup of Cameron's investigative team. Another wanted to know the racial makeup of the grand jury. Why? Ethnic Gnosticism. That is that certain people, based on the color of their skin, have knowledge and their voices interpret what scripture says better and what happens in society better. The implication was that the officers weren't indicted because the grand jury lacked the black perspective. But what about the black attorney general standing at the podium who oversaw the whole thing? Bacham asks. According to the press, he, quote, turned his back on black America, was, quote, no different than the sellout Negroes that sold our people into slavery, and, quote, skin folk, but not kin folk. He does not speak for all of us. Bacham said this, this is straight out of the ethnic Gnosticism handbook. And quickly, MSNBC host Joy Reid, who is black, combined the first and third elements of ethnic Gnosticism when she said, uh, according to the theory of the law that was voiced today by A.G. Cameron, police have the perfect right to bust into your home in the middle of the night if you say you have any association that police are looking for, even if they've already found them, and they can shoot and kill you in your bed and walk away with no legal repercussions. Do you see why I shared this? The people on the news are absolute. Listen, folks, there's no way to candy coat this. If you watch any major news network, and I'm not saying the not major ones are perfect because they're far from it, you are being lied to multiple times a day. You cannot trust anything you watch on ABC, NBC, CBS, or CNN. And you ought to take with a grain of salt what you see on any news network. This is the idea of critical race theory. And here's my big problem today that I want to share with you. We have a host of evangelical leaders adopting their nomenclature and ideas. They're popular speakers even at Southern Baptist events. People who were formerly Southern Baptist, former Southern Baptist, Russell Moore, he's left. Former outrageously popular Southern Baptist, David Platt, he's left us. Habiti Anibawal, uh, Habiti Anibawal, and others, Mark Dever, and Tim Keller, and John Piper, and C.J. Mahaney, and Matt Chandler, and Southeastern Seminary Professor Walter Strickland, and Southern Professor... Um, uh, uh, I, I, missed, I, I missed his name, I can't see it here... But all of these guys, and, here, and here's another problem I have. They all come together interdenominationally at this place called Together for the Gospel. And I want to give you two quotes. Here's one quote. Men should not be judged by the color of their skin. And here's another quote. Pastors should be judged by the color of their congregations. And I'm going to add to that, only white pastors. The first quote was from Martin Luther King, Jr., The second quote was from the Together for the Gospel people. Do you see how the devil is at work to deceive and to derail believers and unbelievers? Here's the last part of being recognizing uh, the threat that tries to beguile us. Christians need to be proactive against heresy. Hang with me, I'm almost finished. 
John says, whoever transgresses, verse 9, and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. In other words, if you make, listen, let me just explain this. John is saying if you make Christ out to be something he's not or less than he is, you've made God the Father out to be something he's not. This should be elementary theology. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so, do these guys sign the Baptist faith and message? Yes. Do these guys sign the Nicene Creed? Yes. Do these guys say they have an inerrant Bible? Yes. Al Mohler stood at the Southern Baptist Convention. I heard him. He said, critical theory is an acid that eats everything that it touches. I got that Southern Seminary professor's name back. But yet he hired Jarvis Williams, who is eat up and goes on CRT rants in the classroom. I'm telling you folks, we are in big trouble. The train has left the station. And last week in this country, I believe it was last week, all over, we are told that we, it is Sanctity of Life Sunday and or also Civil Rights Sunday. And we had Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. But I want to tell you the greatest threat to humanity and specifically to the black community is the devil and his greatest tool is abortion. By the way, the bedfellows that you get in bed with when you adopt CRT are the pro-abortionists. And he's saying don't have fellowship with them. Verse 11, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. This is literally he who rejoices with him fellowships with his evil deeds. That's why I use rejoice in the truth that binds us as the first point. Others are saying, yeah, you're right. We, listen, we don't have everything in common, but we stand against discrimination and racism, and we have this in common. We're going to join arms and join forces. You're fellowshipping with his evil deeds. And the Bible says, do not share in his evil deeds. Abortion is social justice, according to safeabortionwomenrights.org give you another quote. I'm almost finished. Who said this? You'll never get it. You'll never get it. Human beings cannot give or create life by themselves. It is really a gift from God. Therefore, one does not have the right to take away that which he does not have the ability to give. Here's another quote by the same Baptist preacher. I just gave it away. He's a Baptist preacher. The question of life is the question of the 20th century. Race and poverty are dimensions of the life question, but discussions about abortion have brought the issue into focus in a much sharper way. How we will respect and understand the nature of life itself is the overriding moral issue, not of the black race, but of the human race. This was said pre-1980 by Reverend Jesse Jackson. You see, Jesse Jackson was pro-life. But see, Jesse Jackson got a hold of an early form of critical race theory. Or should I say, it got a hold of him. This stuff is deceitful. Are the social justice warriors concerned about black lives? Fifteen and a half million black babies have been aborted since 1973. It is the leading, leading cause of death. In fact, it has taken more black lives than heart disease, cancer, accidents, violent crime, and AIDS combined. Tanya Green and her research project found this to be true. Her name of her project, if you want to look at it, is the Negro Project, Margaret Sanger's Eugenic Plan for Black America. Who was Margaret Sanger? She was the founder of the Planned Parenthood. And by the way, our county commission just voted eight to five to give the abortion clinic on Poplar a big grant of money. So our civic leaders are very much in the majority for killing unborn, specifically, I believe, black babies. This stuff is deceitful. In a Gallup poll, 31% of blacks think abortion is acceptable if you go back to the early 2000s. There's a lot of times people say, well, let's not just vote on one issue. It, you know, there are different issues, Republican, Democrat, blah, 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 blah. 
And, and there are a lot of pro-life black people. There are, that's true, there are a lot of pro-life black people, and there are a whole lot of pro-abortion white people. That's true. But every decade, there are a couple of clicks more pro-choice white people. But now, the black community, when polled, 46% pro-abortion with the last poll. Let me just tell you about these people that say, well, there are so many issues and we don't want to just be pro-birth and you, 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 you don't, don't judge me for whom I vote. I just want to say this. I believe 99.9% .9 of them in their heart of hearts are pro-abortion. That's what I believe. You can disagree with me all you want. But the, this is the greatest enemy of the believer, the greatest enemy of the human race. This is the devil's tool. This is an enemy of the black race. Bodie Bauckham says, At the heart of every malady there is an historic wrong. In the end, the answer to everything is racism. Not only is this kind of reasoning logically flawed, but it also flies in the face of a substantial body of sociological research and the historic preaching and understanding of the black church. And he illustrates this well with that Breonna Taylor case. Pastor, you're getting awfully political with this message. Okay. Friend, my point is, the damage of critical race theory and intersectionality has been done to the American education system, to journalism, and to politics. The battle is basically over, unless we can stop it in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you, how can we let it into the church? I ask you, how can we fellowship with those Greet those who share in that evil deed. We can't. We better be ready. We may have to change the way we give to our denomination. We may have to uh, change uh, and be careful about who we invite into the pulpit. That's my job. And uh, I tell you, I have unknowingly invited a CRT-infected social justice warrior into our pulpit in the past, but I did it unknowingly. I'm sorry for that. I ask you to forgive me for that. But we do not grant them Godspeed, the Old English said, which means we do not give them an encouragement for their success. We don't say, well, God bless you or praise the Lord because you're working for the greater good too. No, they are not. They are not. Real love never lies, and real truth never bites or bows out. We need to hold the institutions we fund accountable for allowing this demonic, rot-gut philosophy into the classrooms. You know, you can sometimes be truthful without displaying a loving spirit. But did you know you can never be truly loving if you use deceit? or a deceptive spirit, and we cannot share. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, what? The commandment of the gospel, the truth, the truth in verse 1, the truth in verse 2, the truth in verse 3, the truth mentioned in verse 4, that which was from the beginning in verse 5, and walking in it, the it that is in verse 6. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Thank you for listening. We have got to understand what binds us together. We've got to understand how to carry on with love and life. And we've got to understand how to be recognizing of doctrinal error. This is very important. This is like a cancer eating everywhere. But you know, as we give our invitation, don't get lost in what's happening in society. You know, the, the most important thing, God wants to use you, but before he wants to use you, he has to save you. You need to make sure you are saved. You need to make sure you have a personal relationship with Christ. You see, once you do, it's permanent. The Bible says no one can pluck you out of his hand. You know, it's also public. I'm going to ask you to publicly profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Would you just bow right now? And if you're here and you, you don't know for absolute certain 
that you've been saved, that you would go to heaven if you were to die. If you will embrace the truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin and rose from the grave, and you're willing to turn from running your own life to Jesus as your master, would you just pray something like this? Oh God, I know I'm sinful. God, would you forgive me? I'm sorry. Jesus, I accept you into my life because you died to pay my sin debt. And Jesus, I believe you rose from the dead. Jesus, save me. Jesus, make me a new person. And then you pray something like this. Jesus, thank you for saving me. And Jesus, help me not to be ashamed. Help me to be public and be found as, as these, this lady's children in 2 John, to be found walking in the truth, living in the truth. I'm going to pray for us. Let's stand and then we'll have an invitation. Lord, I pray that all over this room there will be some sort of spiritual decisions made. Commit, recommitments, rededications, repentance of sin committed this week. Maybe someone, Lord, being saved. Maybe someone, Lord, wanting to join this church or be public through believer's baptism about their faith. Lord, I pray that we will have ears to hear what you've said. And we will do personally business with you. Lord, that we won't point our finger outward, but Lord, we'll come saying, I stand, I'm standing in the need of prayer. And we'll truly do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. For it's in Christ's name we pray.